here to discuss new journalism, and um, I, I was at a journalism school here in um, in the U.S. in the mid '80s, and then the new wait, journalism. Wait, wait, where? At the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and then the new journalism meant, of course, Hunter Thompson, Joan Didion, Gay Talese. I think for today's discussion, we're going to treat that strictly as a past, and with and not talk about it. With me are a wonderfully varied group of journalists. Uh, Bob Shikotis, who's written some of the most extraordinary travel writing I've ever read. Um, it's kind of travel writing with evil Knievel, <laughs> daredevil stuff. He goes, to, he goes to the edge of Siberia and finds himself not with a tour agent, but with someone who says, Bob, when he's complaining that he isn't getting any closer to this wild salmon run that he wants to see, and the guy says, whose name is Misha, which I thought was a delightful de detail. He's a Russian gangster, and he says, Bob, I'm not a tour agent. I'm mafia, mafia, mafia. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought there couldn't be anything scarier than having a fight with a Russian gangster <laughs> far away from civilization. Um, Daniel Lack uh, was a legendary uh, BBC India correspondent, was uh, in Old. Kathmandu. Old and is now with Al Jazeera in Toronto, um, and had such a deep connection with India that years after he left, uh, he was writing for um, many Indian news weeklies, which, and I enjoyed reading his work there. Mihir Sharma um, is uh, a colleague um, at Business Standard, the newspaper I'm deputy editor of in New Delhi. Uh, he's the edit page editor, and a one-man force of nature on Twitter. He um, fights back the kind of right-wing Hindu forces. It's quite extraordinary. It's one person about, against about 10,000. I'm sure they're in a call center somewhere spewing abuse at anyone who sounds remotely rational. But me, he takes them on. So, every so often, when I'm, when I'm trying to get a weekend piece out of him, he wrote an extraordinary piece. We, we have some Russia connections here. He wrote an extraordinary piece about an Indian's responses to Moscow, um, which somehow managed to be political as well as a fantastic travel piece. I mean, in, Indians grow up with this vision of the Soviet Union, a rather positive vision, unlike elsewhere in the world. Um, and uh, they were great supporter of India in the 70s. And, and then um, Mihir went after the ruble had halved. So in between telling us about how fantastic the stakes were and how swank his hotel was, he also no gave... No money whatsoever. Moscow is the place to go. <laughs> Seriously, seriously. $100 a room overlooking Red Square. <laughs> so, so anyway, let me start with Bob. Um, can, can you tell us about that extraordinary <laughs> trip um, to, to the edge of Siberia um, and how you, how, how you actually then came back and the way you wrote about it, how you thought about writing it, it was a very kind of personal way, which does hark back to the new journalism. Oh, of first, can I ask you, younger guys, uh, what comes after Twitter? <laughs> What's the next thing? I think single syllables of expression. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be a next thing. I'm, I'm sure that there's a startup called iGrunt that's worth 20 billion. We just don't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual <laughs> reality emojis. Yeah, exactly. yes, emoticons. Emojis, yeah, there you go. Wait, yeah, and sooner or later, there has to be an extrasensory perception <laughs> yeah. element in all this. So even before, because there's such urgency, I have to tweet this shit out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and okay, so now you know. It happened three seconds ago, and now you know. And that three seconds is too fucking long. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. I do have a potty mouth. I have, I'll, stop, I'll stop right, right now. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I was born. <laughs> um, so uh, I've been a contributing editor at, at a lot of magazines. Harper's uh, liked to send me into war zones, and Outside Magazine uh, liked to send me out into the various um, places in the world where um, that were, in a, in a lot of ways, worse than war, war zones, because um, it, at least in a war zone, you can get a medevac or something. But <clears throat> Outside Magazine, a few years ago, uh, 
all these magazines, they read the New York Times and say, huh, look at that, that thing that's happening out there in the world. Let's get somebody to go write a long-form narrative about it, an article about it. Um, that's how Krakauer went to, went to Everest um, after a piece in the New York Times reported that uh, Everest was becoming commercialized. So anyways, Outside Magazine, um, Actually, they got word back from an outfitter from Alaska who was taking trips to Kamchatka. Kamchatka is the piece at the very eastern side of Russia that hangs out into the Bering Sea. When Sarah Palin says she can see Russia from her kitchen window, that's what she can see. <laughs> um, but they heard from an outfitter that he, the guy had some clients on, the, on a river in Kamchatka, which is, has one of the last great wild salmon runs in the world. Uh, and uh, while they were on the river fishing, a M1 I-6 helicopter um, uh, appeared above them, hovering above them. There was a, a door gunner with a 50 caliber machine gun pointed at them, and they said, get off my river. And um, Outside Magazine said, Bob, go check that out. It looks like... <laughs> <laughs> It looks like the, ma the Russian mafia is stealing all the salmon rivers out, out there in the wilderness. Um, so, uh, you know, these things are half-assed when you try to organize them. They just said, go. And then I have to figure out, like, go where, see whom, uh, how do I do this? And I decided, wow, I'm going to take my wife because this is such a fantastic <laughs> trip. Um, to, uh, to a place in the world that is so special. It had been closed all throughout the Soviet era because that's where they were launching their intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles and some of their space program and their nuclear submarines. They were all there in that forbidden area. So, and it's one of the great wildernesses left on Earth. So I took my wife. Um, the, we rent, went at the wrong season, the salmon. One salmon run had just finished and the, the next one had yet to be and so the, there was nothing in the rivers except huge rainbow trout. And my wife um, absolutely uh, disgusted me forever by catching a 10 kilo rainbow <laughs> trout. That's 22 pounds. Taking a picture of it, putting that picture up on the wall of her office uh, at the First Amendment Foundation, uh, her with this gigantic fish, and saying, yes, and my husband caught nothing. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, I had to bring her back and get, get rid of her. You're never coming with me again if you're taking a fishing rod. And, um, and go back, because I did not hook up with the mafia uh, that time, and I needed her out of the way because it, it needed to get a lot more uh, rugged. Uh, and the next time I went back, I, I did hook up with the mafia. They were, they were quite extraordinary. They uh, took me in a, um, this amphibious vehicle uh, across the tundra, ripping up the tundra, um, across all these uh, river mouths into the Sea of Akast, where uh, the, the, the mafia guys would say, yes, last week Sergei drove, uh, the tide was in, he was stupid, he drove, and everybody drowned. Um, <laughs> You know, and they, and they all have guns and stuff, and they're grizzly bears walking around the beach, and it's all just marvelous. Um, but we get to this river mouth where they want to go, and what they're doing is netting off the entire, the entire mouth of the river as the salmon run, the wild salmon run, is beginning. And they're netting every fish, and they're gutting the, the hens, the female fish, and taking out the caviar. And by the end of the season, shipping 30 tons of illegal caviar back to their associates in Moscow. That's what they were doing. And I said to the head of the mafia running this thing, and they're all ex, they were all in jail during the Soviet times. And then when the Soviet Union went away, jail went away too. And they came out and they started buying all the Russian military equipment because it was for sale. And, and they're stealing whole rivers. <laughs> and I said, uh, I forget his name, let's say Misha. Misha, if, if you keep doing this, your grandchildren will never see a salmon, a wild salmon. He put his arm around me. Oh, Robert, 
Oh, Robert, this is bigger than you and me. And by the way, if you mention our names back in America, we have associates in Las Vegas, in Miami, in <laughs> Pittsburgh, and, you know. <laughs> it was a lot of fun and, and <laughs> enormously depressing. I, I, the, I um, have a tendency to go on and on, so I just, that's the answer to your question. <laughs> I should stop. <laughs> Did you try the caviar? You had the, if you're in Kamchatka and you, you are out of Petropavlovsk, the, the capital city, uh, and out into the bush, and the bush is uh, really bushy, um, there's only vodka to drink. There's not water. There's only vodka to drink. Maybe a slice of bread that you put some lard on. And all the caviar you could possibly <laughs> cram into your gullet. And that's it. That's it. The, the, um, one day, the, uh, one of the... Um, I took a, research, a, a Russian research assistant with us who was doing f fish studies on the river. And she had to go back to the city one day and arrived back a week later with a chirogenic um, container, which is so that's like a frozen container where she could put fish eggs in to freeze to take back to the laboratory. And in that chirogenic container, as she was coming up, she didn't bring it empty. She brought ice cream, ice cream bars. Oh, my God. Really, if you have had nothing but vodka and caviar to eat for a couple of weeks and you get an ice cream bar and your mother or a baby asks you, can I have a lick of your ice cream bar? No! <laughs> Stay away from my ice cream bar. <laughs> Just before we move on, um, would you tell the wonderful story about the Russian woman who decided you were her way out of um, Russia in a kind of joint venture, that you were going to help her do an American joint venture? Well, um, you know, everything was collapsing at this time in Russia. This was the Clinton. Tonian um, Russia takeover of uh, you know of all these business deals and investments and oligarchs and everything, and um, and Kamchatka was losing a lot of its Soviet uh, sponsored industries, and in Kamchatka it's it's caviar and canning canning the caviar. And this woman um, came up to me one night. She was drunk. We were. We're in a staging area where we're getting ready to go way out into the wilderness. And, and she said, look, you have to help me. You have to take these cans of caviar back to the caviar people in America. And you have to do that. And we have to go into business together. And can I come with you tonight? And it, it, the sun's is like going down. And we're, we're going out into this huge river and going to camp on an island and then go farther up the river in the morning. And I looked at her and thought, yeah, but I'm that kind of person. Sure, come with us. And all the Russian guys with me were saying, mm-mm, mm-mm. Where is she going to sleep? What are you going to do with her? She's drunk. She's all over you. Um, and I said, well, the poor woman, she needs, you know, some investment advice. <laughs> I don't know what else. I, I, you know, I never quite thought clearly about it, um, how that night would have ended up if we let the caviar woman come. But the, the Russian guys were bringing like 13-year-old girls with them out oh, into the wilderness. It was bizarre. Like, hey, you guys, there's no um, like pedophilia laws or something? Nah, it's my sister. <laughs> Why <is> she? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to have to switch tracks to, oh, yeah. to, to <laughs> on that note, <laughs> um, to Daniel. Um, and I just wanted to ask you about, uh, there are a lot of criticisms of foreign correspondents and the kind of uh, wars, coups, earthquakes perspective, not having the uh, yes. long game, the kind of longer narrative. Um, I know you've done both, um, and also in your years with the BBC. Uh, it's proved an organization that was incredibly adaptive, uh, moved from just TV and radio journalism to one of the more um, formidable presences on the on uh, internet news. Uh, can you talk about first your experiences as a foreign correspondent and how you've adapted that to these new demands? Well, the BBC um, is, is a strange beast. Um, 
it's probably, it's a national broadcaster uh, of, of, the, of the United Kingdom, but it's got weird funding models. And one of them, the domestic arm of the BBC, the part that people see in the UK, uh, not that we see over here or here on the radio, and put the internet off to one side because that's something they're still working on in terms of how they fund it. Everybody in Britain who has a television has to pay 100, 120, 130 pounds a year for a television license. That, when television began in the UK in the 30s, was the system. It's the system to this day. That produces several billion pounds, a fair amount of money, which is then handed over to the BBC. But separately from that, since the Second World War, uh, the British Foreign Office, their foreign ministry, has funded the BBC World Service, which is a radio service uh, until recently based separately from all domestic BBC, uh, with many of its own correspondents, all of its own writers, analysts, uh, editors, and so on, and working primarily in radio. So they were funded by the British Foreign Office, who had no editorial control over them, and it was seen as a way of uh, projecting Britain's liberal values, small l liberal values, to the world. We are pluralist, we, we, we are part of the world, we cover uh, everything that's important in every part of the world that we have to. And lately, all of that's been mucked around with as everything changes uh, in British politics and elsewhere. Uh, the British uh, Broadcasting Corporation's domestic service now pays for the world service. BBC World Television that we all see here is funded commercially. Uh, not that it supports itself, but the BBC makes about a billion pounds a year selling its programs, primarily thanks to David Attenborough and his nature programs. Uh, that's used to fund television. And then the internet is just a, a whole cross-hatching of funding and sourcing. Uh, and it's always looking for uh, a purpose in life. Um, we correspondents were delighted that we could actually contribute material, uh, increasingly multimedia material, but at first text and photographs and occasionally embedded videos to it. You know, when I started out as a foreign correspondent, I was primarily a radio person. And as an editor said to me, you know, you have a face made for radio. So <laughs> I, I took that at face value and, and actually a compliment. Um, looked down on television, but uh, as television expanded its world coverage and its crop of correspondents, I realized that some of the best journalists in the world worked for BBC television and radio, and I was lucky to be among them. They encouraged us after a year or so of being abroad, and I started in Pakistan in the early 90s, because you know I wanted to start in a simple place where not much happened. <laughs> and it was very lively in my first year. We had five changes of government, uh, four prime ministers, uh, three presidents, two army chiefs, and little old me as the only BBC correspondent. So it, I, I, got, I dropped in at the deep end, and they announced about halfway through my tenure, so we need you to work in television as well. I said, well, since journalism school in the late 70s, my television experience is precisely nil. But uh, they said, no problem, you're on in 10 minutes. <laughs> and that's basically how it happened. Uh, they put us, they just threw us on air, trained us afterwards, uh, very perfunctorily, and occasionally sent us good people to work with. But we, we just, you had a good story, you could put it on any medium. You didn't really have to worry about the techniques. If you had more time and a good idea and so a decent budget, you could look in depth and do a real job, uh, old journalism job, I'd say, of uh, looking for the hypocrisy and the problems and the corruption and the lies and making sure that people knew as much as possible about a topic, shedding light on dark areas. And then when the internet came along, the delightful thing was we could, you know, actually talk to young people uh, instead of just people in their, say, 30s onward who were engaged with the mainstream media, uh, the, the radio and the television. And again, I, they would just say, well, we need a version of that for the web, so we would, uh, we would do it. And on big stories, uh, one of those earthquakes you mentioned that we sometimes got criticized for, or, or, or train crashes, or, or huge political crises, uh, we would do 40 to 50 items a day for radio, television, the internet, and lots of sort of uh, question and answer with various arms of the BBC. So I, I think just the baptism of fire at every stage of that early part of the career made it possible to do all of this. I'm quite surprised I managed it. Can I, can I tell you a quick funny story about the baptism of fire for, as a broadcaster? Okay, I'm not a broadcaster or a radio guy or anything like this. But I was in Haiti covering our inv the invasion and, 
and occupation. And uh, most of the journalists had gone home after it was a switch over from the American troops to the United Nations. But there was a presidential election going on. So CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, had taken back their reporters and they asked me to be their stringer, which is a fill-in. It said, okay, I, I, what do you want me to do? They, we, we want you to p report on the election. So election day, be on the top of the Montana Hotel rooftop where the broadcasting pool is uh, doing f their filming and transmitting back you know, to their stations across the world. I said, okay, so I, this is a Sunday morning. I, sh I showed up at nine o'clock in the morning, hungover, um, up on the rooftop, Right near the edge of the roof, they have an X where you're supposed to stand. And if you have vertigo, you're going to pitch right off the roof. And there's the, this Christiane Almanpour rehearsing what she's going to say when she's on camera. And this other, you know, person and famous correspondent. And they say, okay, Bob, it's, it's your turn. Everybody, all the correspondents are looking around. Who the hell is he? And they go, one, two, three, four, okay, and point to me. And on the monitor, I see the anchor back in Toronto, the CBC anchor. Good morning, Bob. How is it down there in Haiti? I said, well, it's really hot. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, so I hear that the turnout has been low this morning. I said, I had just woken up. I was hungover. I said, where did you hear that? <laughs> Yes. That's the new new journalism. <laughs> <laughs> I think we may be reduced to that somewhat with budgets being cut. Um, Absolutely. Uh, Daniel, before I move on to me, I just want to ask you about Kathmandu, which strikes me as an even more surreal place to be a foreign correspondent than India and Pakistan combined. Um, can you tell us about uh, the, the sort of Maoist insurgency um, and, and covering, covering that? We, were you involved at that time? Yeah, I moved to Kathmandu in 2000, hoping for a few quiet years. <laughs> After seven or eight in India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan in the 90s. And I really, I, I was going to write a book. I, I was going to work on, you know, uh, social issues, developmental issues, all that good stuff that, you know, foreign correspondents hardly get a chance to do, context, whatever. <laughs> and, you know, I was hardly in the country when uh, there were governments changing, there were massacres by Maoists, attacks on remote police stations, dozens killed, and no one other journalists in country. I mean, it's not very, I hate to say it, but that's a great thing for someone who's a journalist, is to be there when things happen. Nepal was an obscure, quiet little corner, I thought, and so did editors back in London, New York, and elsewhere, where not much happened. And boy, did things start to happen. My second year, I was, uh, I'd gone to bed. It was a Friday evening. There'd been some wine. Um, the phone was ringing incessantly. Uh, the cell phone was switched off. And I finally answered it, and, and someone in London said, the prince has just come into the palace and shot the entire family dead of the, Nepal's a monarchy, it, it was a monarchy, it had a royal family, who were a pretty lively, interesting, perpetually stoned lot. <laughs> and I, I said, yeah, yeah, pull the other one, I'm, you know, I'm back to bed. And he said, no, I've just spoken to someone who's married to a member of the royal family and who lives in London, and they're all in mourning. So I said, yeah, okay, fine. This, is, this was even beyond the pale for Nepal. I walked up on the roof to see if I could sense, you know, that something had changed. And the funny thing was, I could. Yeah, I it, was there. You were there. Yeah. I mean, there, it, it, hurt, it, it didn't sound the same. There weren't sirens. There weren't... Everything closed down. It was, it was quiet. Instant mourning. Yeah. And it was just unbelievable. So I, I thought, right, the first thing I need is a camera crew. And I worked with this guy in central, in, in central Kathmandu who had links to the royal family. He was one of the... One of the the senior families there, the Rana family. I phoned him up and he answered the phone. He sounded very, very miserable. And I said, uh, I guess you know why I'm calling. And he said, well, I'm looking at why you're calling. He was standing in the morgue that the army had set up for the bodies. And he described the body of the king to me, the body of the queen. And so that was Amazing. one of my proudest scoops, describing a bullet riddled corpse of a king on the BBC. I left it to you. I was on the last flight out before the airport closed down. Well that done. Evening. Yeah. yeah. No, I, that so was... Give it to Daniel. He can have it. <laughs> Tired of assassinated kings. And then Kathmandu moved through civil war to uh, peace settlement to 
Surreal is the word for it, and now they've introduced a new constitution that we'll be hearing about in the next session from my partner Manjushri Tapa down there. No kidding. That is one of the most discriminatory and racist yeah. <laughs> constitutions in the world. It's just passed today. And they work so hard on it. So this is a country, and it's a journalist delight. It's a country in perpetual crisis that does the wrong thing whenever two choices are presented. <laughs> Which is a good segue to me here, who... Um, <laughs> well known for taking the wrong choices regularly. <laughs> but but um, enjoying the prerogative of all great columnists, he, he um, it manages to drive the previous government insane and now has the current government. Every time a piece of his is published, I think, okay, our, our comments, comments on the website are just going to go completely ballistic. But he enjoys, he enjoys kind of stirring it up. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to ask you, since you're our true-blooded new, new, new journalism representative, do you actually find you've got um, you edit the edit page, you write columns and editorials, um, and yet you tweet with great facility? Do you do you actually see these two as complementary? Um, I think that when I write something, depending, I mean, you're, you're almost forced into a particular uh, mode of expression through the form. So if you're tweeting something, it has to be a lot sharper, more opinionated. I mean, you know, 800 words gives you a certain amount of nuance, 3,000 words gives you a certain amount of nuance, you know, a captive audience for 45 minutes gives you enormous amounts of nuance. So uh, that's all wonderful. But if you're tweeting, then, you know, even if you want to say, on the other hand, uh, Twitter won't allow you to. So um, it, you suddenly become a lot more opinionated, even if you are, like me, you know, a very even-handed person. And so therefore, I mean, frequently it happens that people who first, you know, may have read my columns or longer pieces, and then they see me on Twitter and say, what happens to you? And uh, uh, or people on Twitter who come and read my columns say, oh, you know, you're a lot more boring in, you know, in, in, uh, uh, in print. <laughs> and um, so the, the form does a lot. But what they do have in common, of course, and then uh, you, do, you do get bleed through from one to the other, right? So there are people who um, will write good columns and then if they work really hard on it, might be able to write something longer. But you can always tell when, when it's a columnist book, for example, this, you know, they're switching ideas a lot quickly, uh, a, a, a lot quicker than you know, a lot of other people would. Um, their chapters tend to be shorter. They tend to have the kind of lead-in that, you know, that columnists would give their pieces rather than the relaxed thing that you know, uh, other long-form people might, might, might choose. Um, but to return to the question, so does, you know, does, does one help the other? I don't really know, and I don't think so, in fact. I think that uh, um, if you have a particular form and you work really hard at just that, you will master that a little better. And they do have different needs. And, you know, a longer form piece is not going to... An 800 word uh, a column has to be punchy. And it ideally should have just one idea. A longer form piece can have one argument, but if it has just one idea, then it, you know, nobody's going to finish reading it. And a tweet ideally should have no ideas at all. <laughs> um, so, so there, you know, it's sort of uh, different sort of set of things. And anyway, that's. He writes, he's being self-deprecating. He writes very punchy responses on Twitter. His, his book reviews can be a little uh, digressive. Um, there's a favorite book review of, uh, actually it was a piece about Pondicherry and its beautiful public library. They're few and far between, unlike in Boulder, um, in India. And um, he managed to get, we have a um, Hindu um, party um, in power at the moment, and in some states they've banned the sale of beef, and they may get to Buffalo next. And um, but Mihir managed to work into a piece about a public library six references to eating a steak in Pondicherry, <laughs> which I, I really thought was <laughs> to, to to use a malapropism. Markers people. of civilization are steak in public <laughs> libraries. <laughs> That's right. How did you know that six was enough? <laughs> I didn't have space for any more. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. Okay, before we open up to questions, I'm going to ask um, a, uh, the panel generally to um, tackle the question of using the I word in these pieces, which is both a mark of the old new journalism, the Joan Didion, um, although they, they were more, uh, in some cases, observed more 
you've done it, you've done it very selectively. Mihir does it on occasion in columns. Um, we work for a newspaper where the chairman is a fo former editor and the current editor are so squeamish and so reticent about the I word, that they refuse to allow, even on their columns, a photograph of themselves. So we're, we're, we're the kind of new, the vanguard, <laughs> using the word I is. But, but talk about that a little bit, because you yeah, do it very nicely. It's, it's easy to talk about. Let's go back to, to the notion of what is an opinion. <clears throat> and I, here, I'll give you an, uh, an anecdote or an example that will divide, I think, pretty clearly old school or mainstream journalism from new journalism or something more like what I do. So I, I went to journalism school in the early 70s. My teachers hated me. But it was the heyday of people like Hunter Thompson, Joan Didion, Gay Talese, Thomas Wolfe. And so here is a, here is a sentence. The mayor, dressed in a yellow shirt, spoke for 15 minutes to the audience. Okay, that's a, totally acceptable by mainstream journalists. Here is uh, where it goes wrong. The mayor, dressed in a daffodil-colored shirt, spoke to an audience for 15 minutes. The editor is going to say, what's daffodil mean here? What are you implying? Is he queer? Or <laughs> what is it? But basically, the idea, the old school idea is, adjectives and adverbs are weapons of subjectivity and get them out of there. With, with the new, now it's traditional new journalism, but it, it goes back into ancient history, and, and in America it goes back to Mark Twain. Um, but uh, th there was, first there was borrowing techniques from fiction, uh, character development, narrative arc, um, and then language. Uh, Wolf, Tom Wolf was this youthful exuberance of language. Gay Talese was immersion, self-immersion into the, into the story or the subject. Uh, Joan Didion was, you should have a moral center in, in your sensibility that you're bringing to your reportage. And one of the things, uh, and it's always been there, it's been there since, you know, Cicero before probably. Um, one of the things that became more and more prominent was first person reportage during the, the resurgence of what we call new journalism. So I did this, I did that. And I, when my book on, nonfiction book on the invasion of Haiti came out, a book called The Immaculate Invasion, it was reviewed on the front page of the new, of the, at, at the then, it doesn't exist anymore, Washington Post Sunday Book World. And this, you fill in the blank with it, any dirty word you want here. This guy who reviewed my book I, called me a coward for one thing uh, because I expressed fear during a, during a firefight, gun battle. And um, then he said, get out of the story, Bob. You're, you, because I wrote it. I went here. I did this. I saw this. And my response was, well, number one, this isn't new. This has been going on throughout the history of writing. And number two is, I'd like to know who's telling me the story. It makes a really big difference whether I'm telling you about Iraq or Dick Cheney is telling you about Iraq. <laughs> it's very important. I really want to know. And, you know, and I can judge for myself whether I think you're unfair and biased or you're even-handed and trying your best to get at what's beyond the facts because facts are volatile. Today's facts can be erased by tomorrow's facts. That's fine. That's life. Underneath all that is something more profound. And I just feel more comfortable when I let you know it's me telling you things. And if you don't like me, if you think I'm some hippie or I don't know what the hell you think, um, some cigarette smoker, um, <laughs> then, then you don't like me. But at least you know who you're not liking. And it's not this false objectivity that the Times always does. A visitor asked Fidel Castro, well, come on. It wasn't a visitor, it was Larry Roeder, the, you know, the Latin American correspondent for the New York Times. Why are you pretending? 
What is the masquerade about? And the masquerade about is about a preferred narrative that the main, mainstream media is trying to sell. And all this false equivalency bullshit. Well, if it's just you, there's no false equivalency. Daniel, do you want to add to that? Yeah, BBC had a quite different approach, I imagine. Well, you know, the interesting thing about working at the BBC was I, I, I edited a lot of people's stuff before I went out into the field. Um, but I didn't, I was not over-edited there. Uh, they trusted us to, to tell the story, to, make, to get the facts right. And, uh, you know, we would, we would consult if we wanted to, but we would file our stories, and we were often way too busy to actually have in-depth conversations with editors. And if they had specific programming needs because they were a certain type of program, we would start with the music rather than the screaming, you know, whatever, that sort of thing. But I agree utterly with what you say, that... Uh, Certainly, even as a, as a news journalist, there are times when an eye makes sense in the story. Not always, and not in many cases, especially if it's a breaking event or it's something that's happening in front of you as a, as a, as a broadcaster in particular. But many of the best broadcast reports I've ever seen from refugee camps in Rwanda, from, uh, you know, from, from uh, Aceh during the, uh, the tsunami, the reporter is leading me around and introducing me to people as a trusted guide, as someone who I have seen before and, and who I really want to listen to. Uh, this is not an anonymous nobody um, observing a pure creed that's of importance to a few people in an ivory tower. And unfortunately, this is, a, I think, something of North American journalism that doesn't really uh, apply to, say, the journalists of Europe or the UK or India or elsewhere. There's a little bit more of an approach where you trust the person doing the storytelling. And I think that pays off. I think if you trust people to tell the story as they see fit, they're going to tell the story that needs to be told, and they're going to tell it best. It also allows you to express empathy as a foreign correspondent. Which is our if big If you goal. have it. <laughs> <laughs> You do. <laughs> and as a columnist, me here? Well, I think that columnists have to obviously talk about themselves and what they think. But we rely on news typically that has been given to us by other people. Now, while I agree with everything that has been said so far, let me just sort of try and give you the other perspective, mm -hmm. frequently as a reader. I'm sick of hearing what foreign correspondents or people who go on the front lines think. I want to hear what a larger group of people sitting together and looking at a story have come out thinking has actually happened. Now, when you guys have, you know, you were fighting against a particular narrative of how news had to be produced. I feel the pendulum has swung far too far. Perhaps. All right, we now, whenever I'm reading something, Okay, I, I, know what the person, I know what the person is thinking, but frequently it is almost entirely about that person. There is a point beyond which the eye, taking an eye to a complicated situation becomes both an indulgence and an excuse. And um, it is an excuse because if somebody comes to you and says, you know, there is another side to the story, the person can say, sure, send somebody else, or sure, this is what I saw, and that's it. They do not have any further responsibility to the reader than to say, this is me, this is the story I saw, this is the story I'm telling. To which a reader can say, hey, but I would love it if you felt that you had a responsibility to me to be something more than just yourself. You are somebody out there who's there because I cannot be. And you have to be more than just I, you have to be we. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think that the new, you know, that this tendency to put I in everything has, to readers has sometimes, has maybe it's become a bit of a disservice. Yeah. I agree with what you just said, but I also want to, to add a, a footnote rebuttal to it. Okay, there's more to this story than the reporter has, has offered us, so let's send him back to get the other side of the story. <laughs> okay, let, the New York Times Magazine did this with me on Haiti for a magazine piece I was doing, and I said, you know, I will go back and get the other side of this story. But I tell you, I've interviewed 200 people in Haiti I, from top to bottom and the small middle that there is. Everybody thinks that the culture of Haiti is the strongest, richest thing 
about Haiti and Haitians, and it allows them to endure some of the greatest suffering on earth. And I can't find anybody in Haiti who is going to give me a negative perspective on the culture. And then, you know what the New York Times Magazine said to me? Either find someone and put it in there, or we won't run your piece. And I said, good, don't run the fucking piece. Because sometimes, look, if here's the, the other side of the story, the world is round, the planet Earth is a globe. The other side of the story is it's flat. Okay, do I really have to pay attention to the other side of that story there? And sometimes when you have two valid perspectives, there's still, unless it's a cosmic irony, there's still a right and wrong. And I don't like to be in the business of giving too much credit to something that's wrong or wrongheaded, right? So that's the balance. You know, and anybody who's using the first person I, unless they're a narcissist, they should just be writing a memoir. But the good eye is the guide. Sure. Right. Okay. Um, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Is that? Uh, Maybe one or two. Okay. I'll come the way around. Uh, I saw two hands go up right over here, right here, and we'll see how much time we have at the end. Um, otherwise, I'm sure that the authors would be happy, happy to talk with you and sign books. There are books. 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 Yeah, I'd like to address the new journalism. As we know, uh, the National Geographic is now owned by Murdoch. Few of us knew that before, half of National Geographic was owned by Murdoch. Yeah. Have you ever had to uh, self Censor, or have you been censored in your journalism? Uh, myself, not by sponsors. Um, editors have censored me. Uh, for instance, Harper's Magazine censored me because they sent me to report on the Haitian refugee crisis during the Clinton-Bush election. Mm. And uh, they sent me to South Miami to do that. And I turned in the piece, and they said, Bob, you have a problem with the piece and I said I know I wrote too many words let's start cutting it and they said no we have a you have we have a political problem with the piece and I said how can that be you know I, Harper's politics are basically my politics and they said no you're advocating open borders and I said I'm not advocating open borders I'm reporting open borders and they've been open since 1986 which is the last time Congress passed legislation on immigration and they're open because all the businessmen and farmers in America wanted them open the only people they're close to are Haitians, poor, black, non-English speaking people. I'm not advocating anything. I'm reporting. Well, you have to change it. Well, <laughs> walk away. I'm not changing anything. I'm reporting it. It's not an opinion. I'm afraid <laughs> that we'll have to suffice for our question and answer wow, session. Wow, that was great. <laughs> um, it was just so lucid. Well, it was so... <laughs> It's my job to make sure that this starts and ends on time. But thank you all so much for coming. This is Skyscapes. Um, help us thank uh, Bob Sakotis, Mihir Sharma, uh, Daniel Lack, and Rahul Jacob. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Kadas. We get Kadas. Thank you.